I would like to say, though, uh, this is a kind of ongoing collaborative kind of research project. Uh, initially started out working with myself and uh, Chris Timmerman and Mendel Kalin from Imperial. Uh, I've also been hooking up recently with uh, David Schwartzman at the University of Sussex. Uh, uh, he's been doing some similar kind of research as well, but also using EEG. And then I've had a, a series of, of uh, project students here at Greenwich who've been doing uh, these, uh, collecting the data as part of their usual, usually master's research projects. So Beth Bell Langford, Amy Tollen, Victor Hadzinski, and Gabriella Bergin Cartwright. Uh, so thank you to all of those for helping. They did the really good work. I'm just going to do a terrible job of now presenting what we found. But first of all, uh, I've just and I've cobbled together a bunch of old slides as well. So in the last 20 minutes, uh, and it just it so happens it starts off with this. So uh, you know, welcome to Breaking Convention, everybody. Uh, it started out at Canterbury in 2011, and it has, you know, we, we didn't know who was going to turn up or if anyone would turn up, and. Sure enough, we were astonished that 500 people turned up and they weren't all hippies. Uh, some of them were also academics, which is great. And uh, we've been growing ever since. I'm here kind of now representing Breaking Convention as well as my standard spiel. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was 2013, 2015. And as you know, this is kind of really vitally important that we do this within the academy. This, this kind of movement is kind of constantly growing and evolving and morphing and uh, just do not just your sets. Uh, and so, you know, we, I've got a picture for 2017, but we figured this year is probably going to look a bit like this. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it will, from my perspective, by about Sunday evening. Uh, here's some of my books. I don't know what they're doing in there, but they've all got great Amazon reviews. I told you it was going to be a lot of filler, didn't I? Um, there's a really chewy definition of altered states from uh, Ludwig in, in 1966 as one of the pioneers of the study of altered states. Uh, I'm not going to read that out but it is going to help me orientate to remember what it is I'm here talking about. And that is, you know, we can largely put uh, psychedelics under the larger umbrella of altered states of consciousness. And, uh, you know, in this recent renaissance, we know now a lot more about psychedelic states of consciousness. We have better tools for mapping them in terms of brain imaging and psychometrics. Uh, but those kind of measures and standards and tests haven't really been applied to other non-drug states of consciousness. And uh, so this project is basically a way of can we try and map all old states of consciousness in the same way we're so kind of successfully mapping psychedelic states of consciousness and how psychedelic are other states of consciousness. Um, so, you know, some of the kind of classic features of, and also these are just my kind of normal lecture slides, by the way, now. Uh, so, you know, various states we could include, such as sleeping, dreaming, post and pre-post uh, states of sleep, hypnagogia, hypnopompia, meditation, hypnosis, and so on, and hypnosis, and so on. Is that working? Deja vu? Anybody getting deja vu? That's not really a state, but never mind. And classically, you know, the features of an altered state of consciousness include alterations of thinking, disturbed sense of time, a loss of Control, not always just bowel control, but that's the real five-star experiences. Change in emotional expression, body image change, perceptual distortions, change of meanings and significance, sense of the ineffable, feelings of rejuvenation, and hypersuggestibility. And like classically, you know, the way altered states have been mapped in the 1960s, it was, it was quite crudely done. It was a lot of just kind of subjective experience and reports, and people put forward kind of all kind of fantastic models for mapping these states, such as kind of uh, Fisher's, obviously in 1971, cartography of ecstatic and meditative states. I'm not really going to unpack that, other than say it looks more fancy than it really is. It's basically just a kind of uh, a polar linear kind of extension from uh, what he called, uh, you know, ergotropic states and trophotropic states. So these are kind of hyper-excitability and hypo-excitability. And he figured you could put all altered states along that continuum. Well, that's a pretty naff way of looking at it because obviously there's lots of incongruous things which don't really fit into that. And, you know, it's, so it's, it's, it's rather too linear. And, um, you know, altered states, you can fit them along many, many more dimensions, of course. Charles Tart came along and then said, well, we should think about these things as uh, you know, discrete states of consciousness. So if you could map them along any kind of variable or axes, you would find that different states are distinct from other states of consciousness. And, but those variables you use to map them are as, as many as, as you want, you know, as many tools as the psychometrician has in their armament. 
Uh, and of course, we have various brain imaging techniques now as well. Uh, the use of cognitive and behavioral tests as well. And of course, subjective support reports, you know, phenomenology. The people we can thank for that are people like William James. Uh, I'm just going, this is some dodgy old slides here. Uh, brain imaging is advanced. Uh, rapidly. This is what I did on my holiday uh, snaps. I don't know. This is me going in the brain scanner originally at Imperial. I don't know why these are in the, in the MEG. There's me uh, having been injected with uh, psilocybin. Actually, not yet been injected, otherwise, I'd, I'd have my head in the scanner instead of looking like I'm getting out of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is called MEG, magnetoencephalography. Um, which is like a super sensitive kind of EEG. Um, this is kind of really diversary. And uh, uh, nothing to do with Magneto, of course. Uh, he's rather averse to having this done to him. That's why he wears that metal helmet. There's me anyway. So, you know, at this point in time, the, the, the experimenter would say to me, David, on a scale of one to 10, how intense is the experience right now? And you get some kind of subjective reports which you can map to the, phenomenolo the phenomenology and the time course of the experience in relationship to your, to your brain uh, activity. And at this point, I think it was about a seven from what I remember. Anyway, so that's me having some groovy stuff done on my holidays. Um, and so some of the various phenomenological features you might find could be mapped in this various ways. You can have a whole bunch of different questions and, and questionnaires. You can have kind of pure kind of qualitative uh, interview accounts as well, which you can do all kinds of content analysis on. So what I'm gonna talk about, <laughs> other than just talking about what I'm gonna talk about is uh, various alt states that we've, we've began to map so far. And the first one we did with, with Chris and Mendel uh, and Beth uh, was at uh, an art gallery in North London. It's called the Zidoblevich Gallery. And there was an artist who approached us called Haroon Mirza. And he wanted to build a anechoic darkroom chamber, basically. Uh, based on his ideas, he'd, he'd done some kind of research with, with DMT, and he rather liked the idea of the kind of pineal DMT hypothesis, and he figured that dark rooms, uh, if, if, you know, the production of DMT is related to the pineal gland activity, that immersion in darkness could induce a kind of spontaneous uh, endogenous DMT release. And so he built this kind of really kind of very, very classy, fully suspended, uh, off the ground, uh, anechoic chamber, which means there's zero sound in there. It's actually in the negative decibel range. Uh, and there wasn't even a single photon of light you could detect in there because it's so well shielded. So it's completely dark and completely sonically uh, shielded from the outside um, as an art project. And he wanted us to come in and collect some data, hopefully to try and kind of back up the idea that DMT is somehow produced in there. We didn't do any assays. We didn't take any uh, blood samples. Uh, that would have been quite tricky, it was a short notice, but we did do a lot of psychometric measures, and actually Chris uh, did some EEG. Um, I'm not sure about that though, but no, 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 another time. Um, so these are some of the phenomenological kind of accounts. This is on a scale of, well, that's 70%, so you know, 100% is here. So the, the most uh, uh, noticeable feature of people going into this anechoic darkroom chamber for two hours, this is voluntarily as well, I should admit, uh, there was 47 of these completed the full data collection. Uh, you know, the most uh, uh, pronounced feature was an altered sense of time. Here we are at the center of time. How wonderful. Uh, typically, uh, the experience would uh, they'd have a quite a serious time contraction. So people thought they were in there for a, for a much less period of time than they actually were. They were really surprised when, you know, the door opened after two hours and, you know, they came blinking out into the light again. Uh, but we also mapped to lots of other kind of features. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, one of the other things we were doing is because of psychedelics, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of project of mapping psychedelics, we're also interested in personality variables which may predict the psychedelic experience. Uh, so I don't know how much you know about that, but classically, the one ro most robust measure that we've found to kind of map to the intensity of a psychedelic experience is a, a kind of personality construct called absorption. So this is the sense in which you can very easily uh, get sucked into reading a book or watching a film. Uh, you know, periods of time may pass and you don't even realize it. You know, that kind of a sensation where you drive somewhere and you don't actually remember driving it. That's the kind of deep state of, of absorption. 
Uh, and so this state of absorption, which is a personality variable, you know, and we all kind of have different degrees of how easily absorbed we can get, uh, in some sense, uh, that maps very nicely to the psychedelic experience. So those people who, who have a higher degree of absorption generally tend to have more intense psychedelic experiences. So we wanted to see if that also maps to non-psychedelic states of consciousness. Uh, and uh, so initially, the, one of the things we looked at, we used these other measures, the kind of outcome measures as well. So we had these predictive variables like absorption, but we also had predictive variable of uh, temporal lobe lability as well. Uh, which is, uh, it's not a measure that's kind of very commonly used. It hasn't really been used in, in psychedelic research very much. I have been using it in my research. Um, and those people who have temporal lobe lability tend to have more kind of anomalous experiences. So they may uh, have experiences of, of strange smells, um, time slips, deja vu, strange smells, time slips, and deja vu. Uh, you know, all over again, there you go. Gonna milk a bad joke twice, there you go. Um, so we also use temporal low lability as a predictive variable as well. Uh, so some of the, and then we had the outcome measures, such as like uh, the five dimensions of altered states of consciousness, which includes things like uh, visual imagery, uh, anxiety, uh, kind of transcendent states, and so on. And I'll show you some of this data from the dark room, anechoic dark room. Uh, so this is the first one. So this is a kind of correlation which we found, which is which nicely maps between the amount of elementary imagery. By that we mean just kind of simple shapes and patterns and colours, but not iconic forms. You know, not kind of like people or landscapes or things like that. So general, just patterns and lights, uh, which were actually a very prevalent experience in the dark room. Uh, I can't remember the actual statistics. Uh, because I haven't got the data in front of me, but you know most statistics are made up. Sixty-two percent of data and statistics are made up on the spot. This is no exception, uh, so I'm not going to go there. But we did find a nice correlation between absorption and elementary imagery, which seems to kind of follow the same pattern we see with psychedelics. So people who, who are higher in absorption were more likely to start uh, hallucinating, so-called these geometric patterns. Um, also in terms of complex imagery, which includes kind of iconic forms and, you know, landscapes and people, we say, found the same pattern there again. So we see the same pattern we find with psychedelics with people who spend on average two hours in an anechoic dark room chamber. Uh, we also use some other outcome measures as well. I'll come back to the altered states, uh, psychometrics, but we also looked at mystical experiences. Uh, so, you know, obviously one of the kind of fairly kind of well-used measures these days in psychedelic research is the, the mystical experience uh, questionnaire, which is, you know, supposedly a way of harnessing whether or not somebody's had a mystical experience. Um, the importance of this is that a lot of the clinical research coming through now is showing that the people who do have a mystical experience or at least score higher on the mystical experience questionnaire are the ones who tend to have the best clinical outcomes you know, be it in uh, depression studies, you know, psilocybin for depression, or in uh, smoking cessation, tobacco cessation, or in end of life anxiety, you know, the people who come best out of those studies are the ones who have a full blown mystical experience. And, and by the classic mystical, mystical experience questionnaire, uh, anything over 60%, you have to get 60% in all four of these dimensions to classify as a full mystical experience. Um, so two hours in an anechoic dark room chamber wasn't quite strong enough to, to, to induce that. We got two people, I think, who, who basically peaked uh, over 60%. So they had what we classify as a full mystical experience. That equates to about 4% of a population. Uh, but on average, the scores were quite high in the mystical experience scale, at 43%. So, you know, people are, having, are getting in the direction of having a mystical experience on average in two hours in an anechoic dark room. And of course, the mystical experience scores were also correlated very nicely with uh, absorption, uh, extremely significantly in this case, a, a kind of medium strength correlation, 0.58. So that was kind of quite rewarding. This is kind of seems to suggest that, you know, this dark room anechoic chamber has the same features of a psychedelic experience. And I'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more by looking at the, uh, the five, 11 dimensions of altered states. So these are the classic dimensions we use to map these psychedelic experiences. Uh, 
so you can see, you know, anything in the middle is, is zero average score. This is average score across 47, 46 volunteers, didn't get full data on that. Um, average time of nearly two hours. Uh, and so you find the most prominent feature is uh, a lot of elementary imagery. Uh, so nearly 60% of our participants, uh, well, actually, no, that's not right. Uh, on average, our participants uh, scored, you know, uh, on a scale of one to 100, nearly 60 on, on the notion of having comp elementary imagery. Uh, so they scored about 30% on complex imagery. So elementary imagery, geometric patterns, and lights were much more prevalent uh, than, than complex imagery. And that's you know, typically what I find, is you're more likely to see simple imagery than you are before you see the really far out weird stuff. Um, so that's kind of good. Interestingly, what we found in the dark room was a lot of black and white uh, geometric imagery or, or lights as well, So, which is not something we typically get with psychedelics. They're usually very colourful. You get geometric patterns. In a dark room, it, it goes very retro, uh, like you know, TV used to be back in the day. Uh, so you could think of it like an old-school analog psychedelic experience in that way, perhaps. Um, anxiety was quite low, although actually, which is good, uh, there was only one person actually asked to, to leave the dark room uh, before the end of the, you know, the completion of their two hours. I think they wanted to leave after about five or ten minutes. That's uh, understandable because actually the, the first few minutes in the dark room are actually quite unnerving. Uh, you know, you just kind of shut in this room, it goes totally black. It's also extremely quiet. Um, you know, the, the, the dark room is constructed, the anechoic chamber is constructed, so it, it sucks up all the timber as well out of, uh, out of the air so that you, the sounds you, you do hear have kind of got all the timber sucked out of them. If you talk in there, it's kind of lost all its timber. And so much so that you can hear your own blood pulsing through your ears, uh, which is, you know, a little bit unnerving. And uh, so this one person actually was like, no, I want to get out. Um, which was, you know, we let them out, it's fine. Um, <laughs> we didn't have, we were thinking of having a kind of like a panic button, but there was a, a famous experiment where they did something like this in the 60s, and they found if you give people a panic button, they tend to panic more, right? So we just basically said, look, we're audio, we've got an audio link, and if you want to get out, just say, we want to get out. And only one person did. However, the anxiety induced, even though it's not very high on this kind of relative to the other experiences, is typically higher than what people experience under the influence of psychedelics, uh, like LSD or psilocybin in, in clinical research. So, you know, um, not quite as psychedelic as a psychedelic experience, but a bit more scary, which, you know, says a lot about psychedelics, I suppose, and, and where we are kind of con currently and culturally with them. Uh, a little bit of impaired cognition, disembodiment, so people felt like they were somewhat out of their body. There were some out-of-body experiences as well. Some people also had some insights as well from the experience. You say might you get from psychedelics, some amount of bliss, but the kind of the bliss and the spiritual experience are not so comparable to a psychedelic experience. But you know, some people were having spiritual experiences. Uh, classically, the, the really uh, there was a, a few well-practiced meditators, and uh, you know they said it was it just took them into a very kind of classic meditative state. Some people are having like what you might describe as kundalini-like experiences, like so feeling lots of kind of energy rushes kind of going through their body. Um, but lots of people, some people were getting, you know, some good visual imagery, which, they, which kind of verged on the visionary as well. And even like, you know, some quite high experiences of unity, about 25% across the whole sample. So that's, you know, relatively high, but maybe not as meaningful as, as a psychedelic experience, and very low, in fact, uh, synesthesia, which isn't surprising. In this case, this is audio-visual synesthesia where uh, any sounds you hear are transduced into a visual uh, form, that is something you see. But then this is a completely silent room, so you might not get, expect them to have mo very much audio-visual synesthesia. Um, so that's how we mapped it. We, we also then compared it to kind of classic psychedelic experiences, uh, I don't actually didn't have the time to just rip any like um, of these radar plots from psychedelics. Uh, they would, you know, be somewhat comparable, but typically you'd find as the dosage increases, you, you, they, they score further and further out across this kind of radar. Uh, 
so, but in, in some respects, uh, the elementary imagery was, was as, as high as you would get from a high dose psilocybin or LSD session using these psychometric measures. Now that doesn't mean two hours in an anechoic darkroom chamber is as, you know, kind of visual as an experience as psychedelics. It just means that people score as highly on these psychometric measures because at some point they may have had some amount of visual imagery which, which kind of, so there's something wrong with the way we, we map these things psychometrically, I think, in that you can, you know, you can have a, 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 a simulacra of a, a pure psychedelic visual phenomena in a dark room, but it isn't anywhere near as intense as that, I would say, in my experience, having done two hours in there and from the verbal reports. Um, but in, in most respects, this mapped a kind of low to medium dose psychedelic experience with LSD or psilocybin. I don't have any kind of comparators to show you, I didn't have time to put those together in the last 20 minutes. Um, so that was what we did. Um, so, we, you know, we, we thought this is a good kind of way of suggesting that this, this other altered state of consciousness maps very nicely to psychedelic experiences. It has the same kind of predictor variables. Uh, I've got to say about the temporal lobe lobability. So classically, the, the absorption personality dimension uh, predicts most of the features of, of this altered state of consciousness quite well. Some of them it didn't. Uh, however, the temporal lobe lobability did tend to pick up on a couple of the features that the absorption didn't. So, you know, those two things combined are, are, are a better way, a battery of kind of predicting psychedelic experiences, in my opinion. Um, what else can I say? Uh, and one of the other kind of, there were some other weird phenomena that came out of it as well, which you don't necessarily get with psychedelics, uh, such as a sense presence. Uh, so people, uh, about 10% of people in there had a sense presence, so there was somebody in there with them. We checked there wasn't. Uh, and in 90% of those cases, it was ominous. So people were like, there's something in here and it's not very nice. Uh, only in one case did they actually think, oh, well, that's quite nice. Uh, and that kind of made us think, oh, maybe it's something like a sleep paralysis kind of experience. Some people were, including myself, when I went in there, did have a few little micro naps at least. Uh, but we looked at their degree of sleepiness before they went in there and whether or not they reported if they'd actually nodded off at any point. And that was in no way related to the sense presences. So it wasn't some kind of like hypnagogic uh, sense presence experience in a sleep paralysis kind of way. We don't think this is something unique to the, to, to the dark room, but it's probably related uh, in some sense. Um, and there was one other weird phenomenon which was quite nice, is that a few people reported being able to see their hands in front of their face, um, a small amount of them. But it, you know, there's, you, there's no photons of light in there whatsoever, so how does it you see your hand in your face? And we went in there, it was tested, uh, you know, so we had two people in there, one person waves their hands, they can see their hands, the other person sat in front of them waves their hands, but they can't see them. So this is hallucinatory phenomena like a kind of visual version of the phantom limb, if you like, that a few people have. Well, that's it with the dark room for now. And this is all the other data I was going to present. But you get the same idea. We're doing the same kind of project with other old states. So far, uh, I've done, uh, we had 23 people doing uh, breathwork uh, experiences. You know, the kind of club, not holotropic TM, but a kind of, a kind of breathwork uh, session, uh, which is in the blue. Uh, you can see, interestingly, it, ma it has the same kind of shape but it wasn't intense. So this is an hour of, of you know, shamanic breathing, classic uh, eye shades, very loud music lying on the floor. So we had the kind of the same type of experience, but just less intense. Uh, and if you could map it, so there was a, there was a bit of a dose response in, in the anechoic chamber. So people have been in there longer, tended to have you know, slightly more intense experiences, but, um, so we thought the same thing would, would apply to breath work, but everybody had done an hour. But you'd have to probably have to do a lot of breath work to get to the same kind of state, interestingly. Uh, and then we also looked at people in flotation tanks. So we had people doing an hour in a flotation tank. We had 27 people there, which we did with uh, three different float centers in, in, around London. And again, you see a kind of similar pattern of, of map. We're also looking at absorption, temporal mobility, and mystical experiences with those. But I haven't had a chance to crunch the data just in the last half hour. So uh, I'm going to have to just tease you with that and, you know, come back in a couple of years. I'll probably still have the same answer. Uh, that's it for now, but I will open it up for some questions if I have a few minutes. Thank you.